Richard Koch graduated from Oxford University. He went on to get an MBA from Wharton. He studied some of his work at some of the greatest organizations, including Bain and Boston Consulting Group. He went on to become an investor, which he invested in companies like Filofax and was an early stage investor in companies like Betfair. He's written many books, including The 80-20 Principle, which teaches us all how to do more with less. And we're absolutely delighted and honored to have Richard with us today. Richard, welcome. Thank you very much, Anthony. Excellent to have you here, sir. Yeah. Um, Richard, if we could just start um, by just getting to know our guests. We do what we call a quick fire round, just okay. to sort of get to know you a little bit more. Um, if we could just ask, first of all, where, uh, where do you live? I see you're starting with a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should get this I, right. I live actually in four different places, and uh, they have one thing in common, which is a Mediterranean-style climate. But I live in Gibraltar. I also live in the south of Spain. What we call that Costa del Sol, uh, <laughs> in the Algarve, and in Cape Town. What is your purpose on the planet, sir? Well, actually, I have thought about this, and I think uh, my purpose should be to spread uh, a few counterintuitive ideas that will help people make, make people more productive and happier. Beautiful. Uh, something like that. Yeah. Simplicity, as you say in your yeah. book, is, uh, is, is beautiful. Complexity is ugly. If we could um, just start, you're very well known, uh, Richard, for um, your writings and the 80-20 principle and some of your other teachings there, but you're potentially less well known for some of the phenomenal success you had before uh, some of these things. So if we, in, these, in this interview, if we could just start by exploring some of those lessons you might have learned from the earlier years and then go on to mm -hmm. uh, the 80-20. What, Richard, what are some of the ingredients or um, inherent characteristics of a company that is going to go as big as a bet firm. It seems like you mentioned there that it was a platform as opposed to, mm. um, you know, so it had ultimate scale built into it as purely electronic platform like, for example, Facebook or Twitter mm. or these other ones. But what would you say, and you mentioned management team, what are, what are some of the ingredients of a company that is going to go world class or has the well, ability to? Actually, I, think it's, I think it's really, really simple. I mean, everyone else is focusing on the management team, so I, d I don't actually focus okay. on that. And I find it incredibly difficult to evaluate, and I think yeah. most people do anyway. What I do is look at the facts. You know, is the business growing? Yeah. And is, is it in a high growth market? You know, yeah. it, it's, 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 it's usually evident whether it's growing very fast or not. Mm. And is it the leader in its niche? You know, it doesn't have right. to be the leader in the whole of bookmaking, but yeah. is it the leader in the exchange segment? Yeah. And is that a viable segment? Now, it could have been that that wasn't a viable segment. I mean, it was, in some ways, it was a very risky thing to do because it was operating in a sort of gray area uh, in terms of uh, legislation. Yeah. And it, you, since the betting exchange never existed before, it wasn't clear which rules it fell under. So, you know, but bookmakers lobbied very hard to make betting exchanges illegal. Mm. And it was greatly to the credit of the uh, Blair government, probably the only good thing that Tony Blair did in my opinion, <laughs> you know, that, that they didn't give way to that. And then, then they legislated to regulate it on a right. you know, fairly equal basis with the, with the other existing regulated mm. bookmakers. Mm. Um, but, you know, all I needed to know, Anthony, all I needed to know was, is it in a high growth market, number yeah. one? And secondly, is it the leader yeah. in its niche? I thought the third was going to be, have they read your books? <laughs> <laughs> if we can talk about now the 80-20 principle, yeah. um, because um, it says on, the, on uh, quote, the 80-20 principle, Sorry, the 80-20 principle that 80% of revenue uh, results flow from just 20% of the causes is, one, is the one true principle of highly effective people. So it's mm. certainly worth talking about. So for those who do not know on this program what the 80-20 principle is, and I think there's few, but uh, for those that don't, um, I know you've been asked it a million times, but maybe now you can put it into our website as opposed to having to answer it. Um, if you can just give it a definition, definition of the uh, It's basically okay. looking, it's breaking down the number of people and yeah. taking the top 20% of those and yeah. seeing what results come from yeah. the top 20% versus the bottom 80%. Yeah. And, and so the idea is that you can apply this to anything. I mean, you can apply this to companies, for example. Yeah. Is it true that 20% of companies get 80% of earnings, for example, or 80% mm. of stock market appreciation or whatever? Yeah. And, and the answer to that question is, well, it isn't true, actually. But it is true that there's that kind of relationship. Yeah. Because if you look at the data for the Standard & Poor's 500 uh, in 2011, it's the latest data that I've got, you see that the top 10 companies out of 500, mm. which is 2%, actually accounted for 92% of the stock market appreciation in that year, 2011. Right. 
So, you know, you've got, a, if you like, a, a 2.92 or 92.2 relationship there. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then the research, researchers looked at what had happened over the previous 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so they looked at the top 10 companies over that whole period of time in terms yeah. of performance. Yeah. And what they discovered was that, that those people had actually accounted for more than 100% of all the stock market appreciation, which is really quite an amazing thought if you think about it. If yeah. these 10 companies had not existed, mm. uh, companies such as Apple, I mean, Apple's not included because I think it's on the NASDAQ rather than the Standard Poor's. Yeah. If, you, if Apple had been in there, it would have been even more pronounced yeah, than yeah. that. But if you took out those top 10 companies, then corporate America would be in a pretty desperate state. Yeah, and this is what I mean when I say business is driven by extremes, not by averages. Mm. And in fact, if you, if you took those top <clears throat> 10 companies, they had grown their earnings compound each year on average by between 7 and 10%. Yeah. The other companies had actually gone down in terms of earnings compound by 3.3%. Right. So, you know, I mean, the whole of, you know, I mean, the stock market, you know, does, does well at particular points in time, yeah. you know, you can be pretty sure that that's going to be driven by a very small number of companies. Yeah. And then, Anthony, you can look inside the company and say, well, you know, if you could really measure the value of the output that the people are providing, is it true that 20% of people are providing 80% of the value? Mm. And it's quite hard to do that because, you know, what do managers do? They make decisions, they, they fulfill various roles. But you can do it for salesmen. Right. And it's been demonstrated time and time again, the Prudential, you know, in the old days when they used to have, you know, their sort of salesman with a bicycle and knocking on doors and all the rest of it. Yeah. They actually analysed this for whole of America. Right. Um, and that what they found was that there was a relationship very close to 80-20. The top 20% of people made 80% of the, of the uh, uh, commissions. Right, right, right. And on average, they then compared the top 20% to the bottom 80% and they said, well, how much do these people earn? Because they were all paid on commission and they mm. didn't get a salary. And it turned out that they were 16 times, that the top 20% made 16 times the, the bottom 20%. And that itself was an average. They found that in mm. every single American state, uh, there was at least one um, uh, salesman, uh, uh, insurance agent, who was making f over 50 times the average. Right. So, you know, I mean, it's quite quite stunning difference. So, so you know, yeah. if you're interested in selling insurance, you would actually want to know what are these guys doing differently? Yeah. And, and therefore, Start you know, base, ba base your um, strategy yeah. on that. Yeah. But I'd just like to also draw attention to another thing, which is, you know, very simple, but I think very powerful, which is that if you accept that this 80-20 pattern exists, and it doesn't always exist, and sometimes it's less and sometimes it's more, but let's mm. say that as a benchmark that this pattern exists, yeah. then what does that say about the average productivity of the top people, the top 20% versus the bottom 80%? Mm. Well, we can express this very easily by saying, let's assume that it's true that the top 20% produce 80, 80 units of output, yeah. and we know that there are 100 units of output in total. Mm. So each one of those 20 people is producing four units of output. If you mm. go from 20% having 80% of results, it's got to be true that on average, whatever the unit is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that they're generating four units for every um, person. Yeah. And what about the bottom 80%? Well, if the bottom 80% is responsible for 20 units of output, mm. that means that they're not even producing one unit of output each, they're producing a quarter of a unit right. of output each. Okay, so the top people are generating four units, whatever that is, yeah. and the bottom people are each generating a quarter of a unit. And you don't have to know very much about math to know that four divided by a quarter is 16. Right. Even I can do that. <laughs> so, you know, so what that says is that on average, the, the top 20%, and we're not even talking about the top 10% or the top 2%, the top 20% are doing things which are 16 times more effective than right. the bottom 20%. And if you think about it, that's quite remarkable. We don't expect mm. that sort of degree of deviation. So the hypothesis would be, you know, if I was in charge of a company, you know, and you, it's quite, as I say, it's quite difficult to measure output. Mm. But in terms of value, is it really true? Could it possibly be true that the top 20% of people are actually generating 80% and they're generating 16 times more value than the other people? Mm. Now, this is very helpful if you think about any situation where you're trying to improve whatever you've got at the moment. And what it says is that if you actually focus on the top 20% of methods or people or whatever it is, 
uh, you should aim to have an improvement which is between which is on average 16 times right so so you know let's say 10 to 20 times yeah. it's quite sensitive to whether you know if yeah. it's if it's 70 percent then it'll be only 10 times yeah. but if it's 90 percent I think it'll be something like 25 times or whatever mm -hmm. but but nevertheless it's not a marginal difference right right and you know, this is, I think this is true not only in companies, but I think it's true in life as well, that you can divide the world into, you know, what's really, really super effective and what's not. Yeah. And we all look at averages, you know, we look at averages, everything mm. around us, we look at the average performance and all the rest mm. of it. But what we should really be doing is focusing on the very small amount, which actually is extraordinarily successful and mm. extraordinarily powerful. Absolutely. And we should, you know, if we want to improve something, we shouldn't aim to improve it, you know, two or three times. Uh, we should aim to improve it, you know, 10 times, 20 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, a million times. Mm. That's why um, everyone's so obsessed by sort of modeling success in individual mm. uh, excellence or organizational excellence. Mm. What is it that makes those few companies you mentioned so great? And can it be formula? Can, can there be a. Can you bottle it? Or, yeah, exactly. Can you yeah. bottle it and replicate it? Well, this um, is exactly what my next book, The 8020 Manager, is about, you know. And I've, I've, I've tried to say, well, you know, what's, what is both super effective yeah. and also takes relatively little effort. Yeah. So let me give you a couple of examples on that. You know, one of the things which is always incredibly effective is simplifying. Yeah. You know, because if you think about what does someone who simplifies do, they take a very, very complex picture and they focus on a very small proportion of it, you know, not mm. ma maybe not 2% rather than 20%, mm. but they actually say, this is what we're trying to do, this is the objective. Yeah. And then what they do is they boil it down in such a way that everyone can understand it. Right. Okay. And I think if you're the leader of a company, you really need to do that. And I must say, as someone who's been a consultant, very few companies do it. Yeah. You know, and it's easy for me to say because I don't have to run companies. Thank God I don't have to run companies. But, <clears throat> but you know, if you if you if you've got to be able to explain what the strategy of the company is, what the purpose yeah. of the company, what its competitive edges, and all the rest of it, in a very very simple way, you've got to encapsulate that, and then you've got to make sure that everybody understands it, yeah. because companies, in my experience have got, you know, there's a huge amount of resources and energy in companies, but it's often going in completely different directions. Right. Or at least, you know, there may be a load of energy which is being spent in one particular area, which, you know, isn't being utilized at all. Yeah, right, And right. that's what people should do with, you know, with their lives. They need to sort of get beneath the averages. I mean, we, we internally mm. are all, you know, a combination of things which are very powerful and constructive and productive, yeah. and a lot of stuff which is terribly mediocre, mm. and a lot of stuff which is actually very destructive as well. Mm. So, you know, within each of us, I think, you know, you've got to find the thing that you can really, really do yourself, and you've got to concentrate on that, and, and then basically, only, only do that, you know, as, f as far as you possibly can. It's very difficult if you're a junior person, but over time you can gradually right. manage to do that. So yeah. you need to understand what it is that, that is really, really the most, in, you know, the most influential, the most important, the most potentially far-reaching thing which you can do. It's, it's, it's interesting because in, um, we, we've uh, interviewed a few people, quite a few people, and they've said that in terms of management, it's exactly what you're saying, mm. you have to do the things that you are particularly good at, and also you've got to get your team mm. doing things that they are naturally gifted at. So you're encouraging their strengths and you're sort of managing the weaknesses by, by getting them away from that. That's yeah. something you would abdicate, I, I think. And you also have to make sure that the team are, are potentially top performers in that yeah. particular area. I mean, yeah. one of the things, again, which yeah. I, I preach very strongly is this concept of the A people. And it's not something I originated myself, but, but you know, when we were in BCG and when we were yeah. in Bain and & Company and we were recruiting, we always said, are, are, is he or she an A person? Mm. And in fact, Bill Bain always used to say, recruit to improve the average. Yeah. So in other words, if you're a boss, you have to recruit somebody who's better, better than you, which yeah, is yeah, yeah. kind of, you know, not many bosses are, can actually get their heads around <laughs> that. But, you know, that's the only way of doing it. And the problem that many companies have today is that they do, you know, there's a lot of mediocre people. They might mm. be perfectly, you know, competent, but they're B people or they're, they're, they're C people or whatever. Yeah. Bain and & Company and BCG in the professional ranks said, and McKinsey as well, said, we will only have A people. Mm. And therefore, if we make a hiring mistake, it's our mistake, it's our fault, it's not the individual's fault. But, but they're not actually, they can't pr operate at the same level of effectiveness as everyone else. We have to get rid of them. You know, it sounds, it sounds very ruthless. Right. But in a way, 
it's very good for those people because mm -hmm. they can then find something else where they can be an A person, yeah, so right. uh, rather than you know struggling and failing. Mm -hmm. And I, I failed in BCG. You know, I, I wasn't a brilliant analyst, which was you know BCG valued raw intellect and in, mm -hmm. in analysis, and I couldn't do it as well as as well as I was supposed to do it. Yeah. So you know, it was much better for me to leave That's right. uh, BCG. Uh, and join another organisation. Yeah, a lot of people, as you said, think firing is a sort of an evil thing to do. Yeah. As a lot of people, it was actually sort of liberating that person yes. to go and do something that they're actually good at. Like if you've got a sort of a, a very introverted person in an external sales environment, yes. there's no, it's not nice no. to keep them in that environment. No, it's not. No, let it's not go good. It's not. Else. It's really not good for them, and it's a waste of, of uh, energy for Absolutely. society as a whole. And people have to experiment. You know, you. It, it can take years before you actually discover what you're really good at. The point I'm trying to make is, you know, you often don't really know what it is that you're fant you know, fantastically good at doing unless you experiment from doing yeah. it. And even if you've been successful in something, you shouldn't close the door to considering something else and just thinking, actually, could I do something there which is 10 times, 20 times, 100 times mm. better than mm. what I'm doing at the moment and what anybody else can do? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, was there so many people that go to work miserable, but they're afraid of ever sort of changing. And if they don't change, they don't try new things, they're never going to find the new thing that they actually love to do. And then it's about having the courage to actually go ahead and do that thing. It's also got to, you've also got to be curious, you know. Mm. You've got to, you know, you know, you've got to find, you've got to be looking for something which That's is right. interesting. And you yeah. know, the world is full of new things which can be fantastically successful, yeah. like a betting exchange and yeah. the rest of it. Yeah. You know, if you'd have joined Betfair as a tenth employee, you know, you would be a multimillionaire today, as, yeah. as they all are. You know, yeah. and you know, some I better not say yeah. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I was a fifth employee, which means I'm no, I'm just saying, <laughs> I certainly wish. Okay, so. 80-20 refer time management, as you know, Richard, uh, a lot of people read your books because they are desperately trying to get sort of more use out of their time. They think it's yeah. very limited. And the 80-20 principle obviously sort of is a bit, uh, it cannibalizes in some, to some extent, disrupts the traditional approach to time management. So could you just give us in your own words, you know, what is the 80-20 principle approach to time management? Yeah, well, if you, if you have the hypothesis, Anthony, that 80% of your valuable output comes from 20% of your time, yeah. it's kind of an interesting theory, thing, isn't it? Because if you sort of turned up at work on Monday morning and you did, you know, you worked on the really important stuff on Monday and, you, you know, you did 80 units of output on that particular day. Yeah. And then say you come into work on Tuesday and you do you focus on things which are equally productive mm -hmm. and you do another 80 units. Well, at the end of Tuesday, you know, you've done 160% of what you'd normally do in a week. Yeah. And you've 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 only you know, you've only taken two days. So in theory, you could sort of you know go off and and, and uh, do nothing, you know, go to mm -hmm. the beach, do something more interesting for those those yeah. other days. Um, but I think it's far more extreme than that. I mean, if you look at senior managers, certainly, mm. you know, it's a tiny proportion of their time which actually accounts for the huge majority of, of value. Yeah. Uh, for example, Michael Eisner. Now, Michael Eisner, you know, the guy who was head of Walt Disney and he'd yeah. been head of the Paramount Studio before that. Um, he was a, f a workaholic. You know, this guy was horrendous. You know, he was absolutely, he boasted that in 28 years he'd only taken one week off. He worked seven days a week. When his colleague Frank Wells uh, died, he, go he went to the um, uh, funeral service and, and gave a great uh, oration in favour of Frank Wells. And the essence of it was Frank viewed sleep as his enemy because he couldn't fit in another meeting. Mm. And actually, Frank died because he was in a helicopter. He was rushing from one meeting to another. <laughs> so it's all very tragic okay, yeah. and arrested. So they did some analysis about, uh, uh, but Eisner was very successful. You know, he, he tripled the profits of Walt Disney in the early years. They did some analysis to try and establish how he did that. And it came down to three decisions. He increased the prices in the theme parks, mm -hmm. he opened more Disney hotels, and mm -hmm. he put the animated classics on DVD. Yeah. So those three things accounted for 95%, 99%, something like that, of the, yeah. the increase in profits. Now, how long, Anthony, do you think it actually took him to make those decisions? <laughs> and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, could he really have done that? Now, also, let's just think about historical analogies. You know, it used to be that you talked about horsepower because the, the source of energy was horses and yeah. they were pulling 
uh, oxen, I suppose. But you know, basically, it was you know people were like that. You know, yeah. Henry Ford used to say, "Don't you know? Don't bring me a whole person. I just mm -hmm. want hands." You know, mm -hmm. people who do things on the assembly line, and in the sort of dark satanic mills and all the rest of it. Basically, we were beasts of burden. Mm -hmm. Now you compare that to, I mean, Jobs is the extreme example. But you know, yeah. since. Well, since the beginning of the 20th century, we've had far more scientists, we've had far more people who are actually using their brains rather than their strengths as, yeah. you know, as, a, yeah. as a unit of labor. Yeah. And what that's done, if you think about it, is it's destroyed the link between time and output. Yeah. Previously, the only way that you could get output was by having a lot of people or having them for a long time, like mm. building the pyramids or something mm. like that. You know, but now, you know, an hour of Einstein's time, you know, thinking about E equals MC squared or whatever, yeah. or an hour of Jobs' time going to the, the labs in Xerox Park and, and seeing the future, you know, is just worth so much more. So actually, we're not short of time. And if you believe the 80-20 hypothesis, you can say, well, we're actually awash with time. We've got too much time, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is not time. The problem is that we just make such very, very poor use of time. And we're yeah. not doing the things where we can be incredibly effective. Yeah. Now, a lot of people blame organizations for that. And I think to some extent that's true. But I don't accept that. I think, that, you know, I think it's managers themselves. My, and I am include myself in this, you know, we waste so much time, you know, just think about all the time that you spend, you know, sort of doing your emails or, or you yeah. know, watching the news or whatever, you fail to concentrate on what's important. And what's important is usually decisions and decisions do not take very much time. That's right. Okay, interesting. Yeah, was I, um, after reading your book, I sort of listed all the activities that I do at work. And then I sort of put a percentage next to them in terms of their importance, in terms of how much revenue or whatever the metrics was. Mm -hmm. And I found that I was actually spending a, a, less time on those important things than I was on the other things. And it's like, it's, it was bizarre. So it's a really good sort of exercise to do, isn't it? To sort of yeah. work out what are all the things we do and work out the ones yeah. that are really valuable. It's difficult because mm. sometimes you don't know what the value of something is until, you know, particularly the really important things until years afterwards. But you've yeah. got some idea, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, for example, that if you're, you know, if you're, um, I don't know, if you're uh, arranging meetings for somebody else, that's yeah. not a particularly leveraged activity. No, so what you've yeah. got to do is get more and more discretion so that you can focus on the things that are, which are really important. It's, it's not easy to do. I mean, it's mm. not a magic bullet instantly. Mm. But it, it is, you know, you've got to think very seriously. So, so for, yeah. a chief, for a chief executive, that would be, for example, you know, making sure they've got the right vision, they've communicated, as you said, succinctly, mm. hiring team. So it's sort of working out each individual, what are their most important things out of all the things they could do and focusing on that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. But it's also getting other people to do things. Like, for example, mentoring is a really 80-20 mm. yeah. activity. You know? yeah. If you think back to the people that, that you had as bosses that you look yeah. back on with affection, they're people you learn something from. Mm. There are people who took some kind of interest in you. Mm. And these people actually would do it with a tiny fragment of their time. Mm. But they, but you know, you remember they said one thing, which I mean, I remember a guy called Dan Rawlinson who, who once said to me, it's all about results, you know, and he, yeah. he was running a management by objectives program in the first job I had in the oil refinery, yeah. you know. And I, you know, that took him almost no effort, but he was interested in communicating it to me. Yeah. So, and the whole point about organizations is most people feel undervalued. Most people don't actually believe that anyone's taking an interest in them. But yeah. to do that, as long as you really do care about them, mm. is a, is a, it takes almost no time. Yeah, that's a good point. Because Brian Tracy, we had on this program as well on Leaders, and he said exactly that. So mm. Everyone talks about leadership and everyone talks about management, but at the end of the day, a leader's job is to get results, yes. right? And however you do that, and by utilizing some of these principles. Um, so I just want to ask, let's just say you're, you're a general, you're a manager, and in this day and age, uh, as you know, there's been some cuts, right? Uh, generally, people try and run uh, lean organizations from the human capital perspective. So um, is, in terms of actually ability to, let's just say you've identified these three or four things that are hugely disproportionately more important than the other things. Yep. Um, how would you suggest that a manager actually make sure he, fo he or she focuses on those things I mean, like, without maybe an army of PAs? Uh, would you need an army of PAs in order to make sure you're offloading? No, because actually well, it's, it's very simple, isn't it? I mean, I think on Monday morning, what do people do on Monday morning, Anthony? You know, what do I do for that matter usually on Monday morning? Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you look at the, the phone calls which you haven't returned, you look at phone calls that have come in perhaps over the weekend, you look at your emails, you have a meeting with people. Don't do it. Don't. Don't. Right. Don't do any of those things. Sit quietly in a room you can do this on Sunday if you're really conscientious, but sit quietly in a room and, and work out, you know, 
what do I need to do? What's the most important thing that I can do this week? Or what's yeah. the most important thing that I can do today if it's not a mon Monday morning? Yeah. And then don't do anything else until you've done it. And, but you've got to pick something that's not going to take all day. You, so you, in other words, you, you are qualifying what's important by also how much time it's going to take you to do it. Yeah. So, you know, what can I do which is tremendously important and it's not going to take me the whole week to do it. It's only going to mm. take me an hour or two hours or at the most the whole day. So mm. what's that going to be? I mean, in most organisation is actually talking to a customer and actually making a big difference to the customer or winning a new customer. Mm. It's actually hiring somebody who's going to you know, make a huge difference mm. or firing somebody who's actually you know, subtracting a huge amount of value from the, from the team. Yeah. Uh, it's coming up with a new product idea. You know, yeah. So what you've got to do is to say, you know, what is really, really important and mm. will achieve great results, mm. but I can do it with relatively little effort. You know, I can do it in an hour or I can do it in a day. Right. And you don't do anything else until you've done that. Now, mm. organizations are conspiracies to stop you doing it because there's phone rings, there's a meeting and all the rest yeah. of it. So I always say to people, get out, you know, get out of the office, you know, find a reason why you're not there and, and, and you know you, you don't goof off you actually you're trying to do the one thing which you're which you yeah. reckon is hugely important yeah. and then once you've done that what a sense of relief you mm. get I've been useful you know I've actually <laughs> earned my salary f this week That's and right. I've, I've done it by lunchtime or Monday mm. and then you can do the f more fun things then you yeah. can think about the future then you can think about helping out other people then yeah. you can go and have lunch with a casual contact you know, it's 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 all about adding a huge amount of value with relatively little effort from yeah. you or, or indeed from the rest of the team. Yeah, interesting. I suppose that, that's what the late Stephen Covey says is the rocks, the important things. You put the rocks in the diary first and then all the little things have to go around those rocks, not the other way around. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm more extreme than that. You know, I would say don't even look at the diary. Don't make a to-do list. Yeah. You know, basically... So said to make a not-to-do list. A not-to-do <laughs> list, yeah. Or just have one thing. You know, if you're just at focusing on one thing, you don't need to write it down. Right. Because you've got it in your head, yeah, and do it, you know, yeah, and get it out of the way, yeah. Make that decision, which could be potentially very, very important, mm. but just do it, you know. Mm. So don't, you know, don't worry about the rocks and all, all the other stuff. Okay. Now, it's okay. it's a little bit unrealistic. It's, I mean, I have to say, you know, it takes, in a way, it's, it makes life a lot easier, but mm. it takes a great deal of determination, and it takes a great deal of nonconformity as well. Yeah. But those are the people who are successful in life. They're yeah. the people who don't listen to other people. They're the people who, who work out something that's very important and actually make sure that they, that they do it. Yeah. So to some mm. extent, it goes against the whole ethos of, a, of an organization. And necessarily, an organization's got to have discipline and all the rest of it. But the people who are really, really successful are the people who actually focus on the results and yeah. focus on things that they can do better than anyone else and that yeah. don't take a lot of energy or time. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, because um, Peter Drucker says that management is doing things right and leadership is doing the right thing. So yeah. he seems to agree with you. In, in well, smile. I agree with him, actually. Yeah. I, mean, he, he, <laughs> I mean, he came up with most of the stuff. I mean, Drucker never focused on the inputs quite, quite, quite that much, no. but he did focus on the results. And, yeah. you know, I think he was probably, along with Bruce Henderson, the, mo you know, the best guru ever. Yeah. Richard, if we can uh, play the one piece of advice game now, I'd, I'd love to. So um, people in these circumstances that would just love to hear your, your piece of advice to them. Um, and that is, uh, you talk about happiness island. So somebody's f fundamentally miserable in their job, right? Um, and they haven't found uh, uh, their love and their career up until date. What, what should they do? Well, the whole idea of happiness island is terribly simple, which is you think about the times at work or the times outside work that you've been happiest. And you know, it may be small fragments of time, it may be a period of years, but a small part of your total career if you've been working yeah. for some time. And what you do is you, you just say, where was I happiest? You know, and you visualize it, you know, mm -hmm. what, what was I doing? Yeah. Uh, or where have I been most effective? What was yeah. I, you know, what was it? You know, mm -hmm. was it I was giving a speech? Was it I was talking to somebody? Uh, was it I was coming up with a new product idea? Whatever it was. 
Um, or was it simply in, t you know, forget about work, was it simply spending time with a particular person? Or and then you try and work out what the common denominator is between your happiness islands. And if you're unhappy, it's very easy to do this because there won't be many of these happiness islands. Yeah, so, yeah. But, but then you say, well, you know. And then you put yourself in a context where that works. And a lot of people accept that they're in the job or the life that they're in, but yeah. they don't have to be in that. And, you know, often it's easier to change the context than it is to change yourself. Right. And so, you know, you leave one organization, you join, join another organization, or you think about life in a different way. Yeah. I mean, think about snakes. I always th think mm -hmm. about avoid the snake pits. You know, people are trained not to be afraid of snakes. Well, I think that's, that's ridiculous. You know, you shouldn't go near the jungle or the pet shop or whatever. And so, you know, don't do the things that make you unhappy. Do the things that, that make you happy. Mm. And, you know, it's not just that, that, that makes people happy, it also makes them more useful to other people. Yeah. You know, you can't achieve something unless you really feel that you're in the zone, as, as, as said, you know, you, that you're actually, you know, mm. doing something which you are meant to do mm. and, and that you're confident and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So, you know, I think happiness and achievement are very often linked to each other. And this goes against mm. the whole, you know, Puritan ethic, it goes against the whole idea that work is meant to be a grind and, and all the rest of it. Mm. But the 80-20 principle, I think, reinforces this. It says that actually you focus on the very few parts of yourself or the very few activities which actually can give an enormous explosion of energy. Absolutely. Yeah, because very often the things that make you happy are the things you're good at and you come hand in hand, you find work, uh, or you do that during the day and you get happiness and extraordinary results. So what about a company uh, that has uh, looked at the 80-20 principle and they've analyzed their products and indeed that they've got 80% uh, of their revenues or success or profits are coming from 20% of their products. So they go to those 20%, they focus on those, but then they say, well, what about innovation? How do, what about the new products that we can't currently analyze? Yeah. Where does that have its sort of positioning within the 80-20? Well, I think experimentation is, is, oh, yeah. uh, is necessary. I mean, eighty twenty principle is a means to an end. It doesn't say that you should just focus on what you've got now. Yeah. yeah. And you should focus on what it is that the, yeah. you know your best customers want. And we haven't mentioned yeah. customers, which is a major omission on my part. You know, it's nearly always true that twenty percent or fewer of customers give eighty percent or more of profits if you actually do the sums in the in, yeah. in the right way. So what you need to do in terms of new products is talk to those people and work out what it is that they would buy from you that they're not buying from you at the moment that you can make in a similar sort of way using the same sort of advantages that you have okay. and it's uh, you know as an American guru called Chris Zook who talks about repeatability and I think that's right you know you come up with a formula which you can repeat and it mm. applies to individuals as well mm. so yes of course you, you need to analyze the products that don't exist yeah. and also you know you need to think about meeting people who might be very interesting, even though they, have, they play no part in your, your output or whatever at the moment. Mm. I don't know if you know the Canadian singer Michael Bublé, but yeah. he came up with a fantastic song, which he co-wrote, uh, called Haven't Met You Yet. And the whole thesis behind it is he's, he's saying thank you to this person who hasn't met yet, who's going to make his life very happy and very yeah. corny, but, but yeah. actually I think rather charming. Yeah. And, you know, haven't met you yet it works in business as well you know there are people out there who you know they may be employers they may mm. be colleagues that you're going to partners that you're going to work with they may be customers uh, they may be people who just give you an idea mm. and I, I'm always preaching that you should you know focus is great but mm. you should also connect with people in completely different mm. worlds and get ideas because it's the ideas which drive innovation yeah. And I think that's a great point as well, because as you said about focusing on the customers and speaking to them in order to get new ideas from those top 20% of the customers, and that's why it seems that all the chief execs we've interviewed, they spend a disproportionate amount of their time with customers. They're out there on the front line, they're also out there with staff. So any other advice do you think on uh, working as a chief executive, particularly as it applies to the 8020? It's the people you hire, isn't it? You've got to, you've got to have the right team. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, the 80-20 principle says you probably haven't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or, or, and also, yeah. you've got to realise who the great contributors are. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, in some ways, the 80-20 principle is inevitably elitist. And I, I mm -hmm. think any really successful chief executive I've observed has got two or three colleagues that they rely on, and they're kind of like co-conspirators. Yeah. So you've got to have your co-conspirators. 
because yeah. what you're trying to do is change the organization, not just keep it as it is. And changing an organization is incredibly difficult. So you need to have you know, a few people who are incredibly good at doing that. What, what about, just very quickly, uh, the concepts like devils in the detail, which would, or um, you know, the long tail, which, which suggests now that in this internet age, you actually make a lot of profit from those 80% of communities that are not, you know, like Amazon, for example, they sell, they don't just sell the best sellers, they sell niche yeah. community products. Well, devil in the detail, I think, is a great phrase because the, the detail is the devil. And there are lots of things in life which are very complicated, and um, retail, for example, is that, you know, anyone that wants to be 80 20 should stay out of retail. <laughs> the devil is in the detail because it confuses people. Now, focus on yeah. things which are simple and which have simple solutions. Okay. As far as a long tail is concerned, the, long, the tail has become uh, long longer, but it's also become fatter and that all of the profits are in the head, not, not in the tail. Wow. And, uh, you know, Chris Anderson, great, great thesis, you know, um, mm. it, the great virtue of it was that it could be verified or disverified. And uh, uh, there's loads of research that's been done in the last five years which says it's just not true. You make your profits out of your best sellers. Good old 80-20 principles, lifelong yeah. principle. Love it. Um, what about hard work? Because it, uh, the 80-20 principle, one of the pioneers called it the principle of least effort. Yeah. So a lot of people might get confused and think, oh, this is laziness. I love this. And is it, w what do you actually think about hard work? I'm against it. Okay. I mean, Ronald Reagan said, they said hard work never killed anyone, but I figure, why take the chance? <laughs> <laughs> and, but the point is, it's not enough to be lazy. You've got to be determined as well. Yeah. So, and actually, a lot of us are not lazy enough. You know, I mean, I've, I find it quite hard not to work, you know, reasonably hard. I mean, I mm. probably only work three or four hours a day, but I'm doing lots of other things which are, which are sort of feeding my, my uh, interest and all the rest of it. But over time, I've tried to work fewer hours. Yeah. I've tried to uh, work less tried to travel less and, mm. and so on and so forth. And I tell you, Anthony, it's difficult. You actually have to be quite determined to be lazy. But to be lazy is great because if you've only got a very limited amount of time, then you, then you make, on, on a particular thing, then you make the best use of it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, again, just one final story, because mm. uh, I'm sure we're coming into mm. the closing minutes of this. Uh, you know, there was a story about some American scientists who, who, who visited Ernest Rutherford, the guy who split, mm. split the atom, in his laboratories in Cambridge, and this was in the 1920s. And these guys were not impressed because they looked around and they said, you know, these are, these are shitty, you know, laboratories, you know, uh, not, you know, we got far better facilities than that. And he said to them, it's true, we don't have much money, so what we have to do is to think. And the difference between human beings and other animals is that we can think, we can plot, mm. and, and we can do that. So be lazy, but mm. think and plot with your life and your time. What, you know, what impact do you want to have on this earth? Yeah. And if you want to have an impact, then you need to limit what you do, because otherwise you won't be able to see the wood for the trees. Mm. And otherwise, you'll be too busy trying to do things that other people could do. Mm. So. It's, it, laziness is great, but it's got to be laziness allied to extreme ambition. Yeah. And nobody else is preaching that as far as I know. No. I don't like hard work. I'm against no. hard work. Hard work is a slave mentality. Yeah, absolutely. And that forces you, therefore, to focus on a few things because you need to get results, right? Laziness yeah. without results is no, it's just late. I mean, that's not effective, right? Yeah. Um, okay, that's great. And uh, that links us on to a philosophy. You, you told us uh, before this program, you said to us, Anthony, I've got a different philosophy to most people. Can you just. Uh, well, it's less is more. I mean, it's this whole 80-20 okay, thing. It's, you know, do fewer things, but do the really important do well. things. Do the things that you're incredibly good at doing or which excite you, because unless you're excited about something, do the things you care about. Yeah. You know, I'm always struck by people at work, and I say to them, you know, do you like your job and all the rest of it? And they say, yeah, it's fine. And I say, OK, on a scale of 1 to 10, is it a 9 or a 10 that you really care about this? And the majority of people don't. Well, if you don't care about something, how do you expect? to have an extraordinary impact. Mm. So, you know, you've got to do things that you really, really care about. And if you don't do that, and the majority of people don't, then, you know, you're not going to add much to the world. That's right. But, but don't think that it's hard work. It's not hard work. It's hard thinking. And that doesn't take very much time. It's a beautiful note to end on, but I'm not going to quite. <laughs> because, um, Richard, you've, you've proven yourself in, in so many areas, academia, business, entrepreneurship, but what? I feel a sting in the tail. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you're, 
you know, you've got other people that are sort of household names. You should be out of thought a household name with your books, with your writings, your teachings, your philosophy. What, A, why are you not, but B, where are you going? What is it you love to do? Where you I going? haven't taken publicity seriously. I haven't taken the large corporate market seriously because, frankly, you know, I've always been more interested in entrepreneurs and so forth. And I think large corporations have got some very fundamental issues. Every large corporation is very difficult to run a large company. Um, so what I've got to do to have more impact is to is to have a website. I've never even had a website except for particular books, you know, and, and uh, that's that's coming up very shortly. I do need to generate more publicity, and I need to get some allies. I need to have people who are working with me, and uh, I'm trying to work on those three things. But you're quite right. You know, I'm I'm actually just a shy retiring guy who lives in these very nice places. And maybe that has to change, but we'll see. So, Richard, all the way from the beginning, you've been phenomenal. Thank you so very much indeed for your time with us today. It's been an honor to have you with us today. Thank you. You're welcome.